The most common justification for intellectual property is a utilitarian one. In the words of the US Constitution, intellectual property exists in order to promote the progress of science and the useful arts by securing for limited times to authors and inventors the exclusive right to their respective writings and discoveries. On this utilitarian theory, the reason we need intellectual property is because without it, ideas and their expression can travel freely between people. As Thomas Jefferson explains, if nature has made any one thing less susceptible than all others of exclusive property, it is the action of the thinking power called an idea. Ideas in nature cannot be controlled. Their flow is not restricted to particular people. So unlike a physical object, like an apple, for example, ideas and their expression are what we call non-rival and non-excludable. We say that an apple is excludable because if I have an apple, I can stop you from taking it. We say that it's rival because if I give you my apple, I no longer have an apple. Ideas, on the other hand, are both non-excludable and non-rival. Normally, I can't stop you from copying my idea. But even if you do copy it, it doesn't leave me worse off. We call it non-rival because your use of an idea doesn't interfere with my enjoyment or my use. So ideas are what we call public goods. Another classic example of a public good is a lighthouse. Imagine you're a sailor. Everyone benefits from lighthouses because they help us avoid running into the land. But the benefits that lighthouses produce are non-excludable. This means that once you build a lighthouse, you can't stop me from using its light to navigate. Because you can't stop me, then I have no reason to pay money towards the costs of building and running the lighthouse that you incurred. So the theory goes, if people can never recoup their investment, they are unlikely to build a socially optimal number of lighthouses. The result overall is that everyone loses out. This is the public goods problem. There are a few different ways we can fund the cost of building public goods. One option is that the government can use tax money and pay for it directly. IP is a different type of solution. It provides a legal monopoly. By providing a right to exclude others, it enables the owner to charge people for access. IP then provides an incentive to invest in the creation of valuable public goods. The utilitarian justification for IP ultimately rests on this point. Without the ability to exclude free writers, inventors and authors would have no incentive to create. They would go do something else with their time and society would be worse off. But there's a problem with this justification. Remember the story of another famous apple. As Isaac Newton or someone else said, if I have seen further, it is by standing on the shoulders of giants. It turns out that ideas and expression are inputs as well as outputs of the IP system. All knowledge and all creativity builds upon the past. So if we go back to Jefferson for a moment, later on in his letter, he explains how great it is that ideas can freely spread from one to another over the globe so that everyone can benefit. IP systems in their design are never perfect. The cost of providing incentives by creating property rights is that some people are necessarily excluded from accessing either the invention or the creative work, even though their use isn't costly and doesn't interfere with other people's enjoyment. This means that if the monopoly rights are too strong, we end up getting less progress, whatever that means, because we have limited the flow of knowledge and culture. So ultimately, Intellectual property is a balance. It should be strong enough to encourage investment, but leaky enough to avoid unduly interfering with new innovation, chilling speech, or limiting the flow of culture. One of the big challenges we face today is that we really don't have the data that we need in order to come to a conclusion about where the appropriate balance lies. Most of the disputes that we have about the strength of intellectual property today come from some fundamental disagreement about whether or not IP rights are too weak or too strong. 
Lobby groups that represent owners of intellectual property point to all of the infringement around the world and claim that it's harming their incentives. On the other hand, other groups complain that IP is often too strong and that it's making innovation and creativity much more expensive than it needs to be. Ultimately though, economists don't have a good answer to this question, which makes the utilitarian analysis, as we currently understand it, fundamentally indeterminate.